Hi, I'm John Turner, and I'm going to give a background talk here to help understand some of the fundamental components of uh, Afro-pessimism in order to facilitate my elective on responding to Afro-pessimism. Um, the premise here being that you need to understand and, and better um, comprehend the language and vocabulary that's being used in Afro-pessimism to understand what some of the core responses to this position might be. The structure of this talk is going to be to read through um, an essay of probably the most prominent Afro-pessimist, uh, Frank Wilderson III. Um, the essay, if you want to read along um, and follow some of the portions of it that I'll be using to introduce key terms, is The Prison Slave as Hegemony's Silent Scandal. And it is available using the library resources that you have access to here at DDI. Um, I'll also at one point reference um, a longer card from another essay of Wilderson's Gramsci's Black Marks, um, Wither the Slave in Civil Society. And for the purposes of this talk, I'm going to go about defining some of the key terms that you'll encounter in the kind of conflicts between Afro-pessimists and other um, interpreters of either the Black radical tradition or um, other forms of uh, kind of left-wing criticisms of uh, criminal justice. And the terms that we're going to go over in the first portion of this background discussion are civil society, hegemony, antagonism, and slavery. And if you start the, just with the very beginning of the prison slave as a Gemini silent scandal, the Wilderson essay, you'll see right away that Wilderson is working on establishing the uniqueness of uh, black positionality um, in American civil society. Once again, we'll define civil society here in a little bit. Um, and that then that also requires establishing a relationship between blackness and civil society. So the epigraph that the essay begins with, the black experience in this country has been a phenomenon without analog, should form kind of the understanding that you have about the way in which Wilderson is setting up an argument about the role that blackness plays in American life and in American civil society. And that is that there is no analog or um, similar position to the position of blackness. And he establishes right away what he sees as the unique feature of blackness in civil society in the United States. Um, this is on page 18, the very opening of the essay. Quote, there is something organic to black positionality that makes it essential to the destruction of civil society. There is nothing willful or speculative about this statement, for one could just as well state the claim the other way around. There is something organic to civil society that makes it essential to the destruction of the black body. Blackness is a positionality of, quote, absolute dereliction. He's citing Franz Fanon here. Abandonment in the face of civil society and therefore cannot establish itself or be established through hegemonic interventions. Blackness cannot become one of civil society's many junior partnerships, partners. Black citizenship or black civic obligation are oxymorons. Um, oxymorons meaning that they're contradictions in terms. So the kind of summary for that paragraph, the idea that civil society constitutively excludes blackness means that we need to think a little bit about what style of relationship um, Wilderson is arguing here for between blackness and civil society. And constitutive exclusion, not the term that's used um, in this paragraph, but I think a term that will be useful for helping us to understand and read a variety of this material. Um, constitutive exclusion refers to a relationship between two elements in a system that are, the exclusion is both essential and logically necessary. So think about the word constitutes or constitutive. If we say that A constitutes B, then in order for B to exist, so must A. Um, you could think here about the Constitution of the United States. In order for the U.S. government to exist in the form that it does, it had to be constituted. It is constituted by the constitutional framework. Um, and a constitutive exclusion could be contrasted um, with a contingent exclusion. And a contingent relationship is a possible relationship between two elements in a system. So if a relationship between A and B is a contingent one, that means that that relationship or the way in which those elements are related is one among many possibilities for how they might be related. And the 
you know, concept here that civil society constitutively excludes blackness means that there must be something that is essential and logically necessary about the exclusion of blackness from civil society. That is, in order for civil society to exist, it must exclude blackness. And the, you know, the terms that I'm drawing on here from the kind of quote that I gave to um, from the opening of this essay, the idea that there is something organic to civil society that makes it essential to the destruction of the black body, that's that notion of an essential relationship. It is, it is of the essence of civil society. That is, in order for civil society to be as we understand it, it must exclude um, and destroy blackness. So what then do we mean by civil society here? And I think that this is a place where sometimes there's some confusion, um, in part because oftentimes we refer to civil society and debate as though it was this, meant the same thing as the state. Um, and in most political theory, especially in the liberal political tradition, civil society doesn't refer to the state. It refers to institutions that are public, but not part of the government. So, you know, political parties, neighborhood associations, or, or similar groups, um, social movements would be examples of um, organizations that you'd find in civil society. Um, and in many versions of liberal theory, civil society kind of stands in between the private sphere, that's contracts, the marketplace, and the public sphere where um, you know you find the government. So that the government is um, you know interested, is it is invested with a public interest. It is about a, it is a public operation. Um, the private sphere, the market, is distinct from the public. Civil society covers a, a different set of institutions and a different set of relationships, and you know, this notion of civil society and, and civic associations get, gets into that idea of civic life that, you know, as a, a member of a community, as a member of a city, that's, that's the kind of root term for um, civil society is this notion of a, a city, um, that you're a member of a community who is engaged in a lot of different relationships um, that have a number of different characteristics, but all of those characteristic are th characteristics are things that might be different than in a public relationship of authority, right? So the, the public institutions that have um, authority to enforce certain obligations on citizens. So, you know, if you think about it, that the government um, can tax its citizens. Um, conscription would be an example of a, a public obligation that is entailed by being a citizen. Um, the voluntary or contractual relationships of the marketplace from a liberal perspective. There are obviously many perspectives that would treat that as not a voluntary set of relationships, but that a, a contract is something that you're choosing to sign. Whereas in a, in a public relationship, it, what you're talking about is a, a set of ob obligations or authoritative relationships. In civil society, you'd find relationships that aren't necessarily about private self-interest or purely about kind of public authority. They're instead relationships that might be, you know, you might find some something like um, friendship or solidarity or allegiance or kind of conflict or disagreement, right? That you might have civil debate there or the idea of civil discourse that you're expressing disagreements and um, different concepts about what might be in the public interest or regulations that we might impose on private conduct. Um, that is laws that might extend into the, the private realm. And in the kind of liberal political tradition, the notion of civil society is grounded in the idea that there are, you know, there's no single version of the good life. Um, we can't know for sure um, what it means to live a good life. There are many disagreements about what a good life might be, um, that there's kind of an essential pluralism to notions of the good. We're never going to find complete agreement about the good life. And so liberalism privileges liberty as a value, in particular individual liberty in most elements of the liberal tradition. The idea that we should be free as individuals to pursue different versions of the good life. Um, that, um, you know, that there's not kind of one authoritative version of that. And part of the kind of importance of the liberal tradition is that, you know, you see that in contrast to the kind of prior um, uh, European feudalist tradition in which the, de the definition of the good life came from kind of at least two sources, but most importantly, the church, right? That you have a, a definite understanding of what the good and the moral life is, and it, 
you know, was about affiliation with a particular religion, the Roman Catholic Church. There are a number of then religious conflicts over <laughs> the nature of the religious good life um, in the Reformation, um, different kind of schisms within the Christian Church. But um, in a feudal society that operated in Europe with the background of kind of the Christian version of the good life as a defining element of public life, you also have the kind of the element of the um, authority of the the state, um, and in particular the the notion of an aristocracy, a nobility, um, in which the the same grounding is found there um, in in God and religion, the notion of the divine right of kings. That you know society is society and the good life are ordered according to one. Um, or two locuses of authority, and that that authority is definitive. In the liberal tradition, where you're at liberty to pursue different versions of the good life, civil society is um, the arena in a way in which we can debate about, exchange, have discourse about the good life. And as participants in a civil society and in a civilized society, that um, there's this kind of combination of self-interest and sociability, that you're um, articulating what it is that you want out of life, but there is also an assumption that you share a, a kind of understanding that um, a, version, a vision of the good life is not absolute, that you're engaged in civil exchange, that is, you know, civil being bounded by custom, by uh, sympathy and emotional identification. And, and, you know, like I said, some of those concepts about, about friendship or civility also in terms of civilian, that is in contrast to military uh, life, you're not going to take your disputes to the level of force and um, kind of physical aggression and violence. Um, that's this idea of civil society is kind of a marketplace of ideas where what you're exchanging are words and concepts, not um, you're not fighting with weapons or, or using arms if you're part of civil society. And that is you know, part of the way too in which civil society has the additional connotation for some of these theorists as participating in civilized life. Um, and the kind of classic comparison there is um, the contrast between civilized life and barbarian life. And that's the subject of a, a number of criticisms of this kind of liberal tradition or the idea of a civil society is the way in which it sets up a standard for what it means to be, um, you know, that implicitly it does have this version of the good life that's kind of built into it, that, you know, life that doesn't look like the civil exchange of discourse, the participation in kind of uh, the, the marketplace in a private sphere uh, in contrast to a, a, an ordered public life, that if it doesn't have those features, then, then maybe that's not such a good life after all. And so implicitly, maybe that civil society draws on a hierarchy between certain forms of life. And I want to note here that in the criticism of the of the pessimists, civil society is likely being used in a way to capture um, some element of that notion of civilization um, that implicit in arguments about civil society is a contrast between civilized and uncivilized forms of life and that that division is being criticized here as you know implying that other forms of life are barbaric or not worthy of being lived or you know not on the same plane or as part of the you know the lower in the hierarchy or the or the the on the ladder of of what it means to live a good life and so the criticism of civil society that we'll find in this essay is then also a criticism of the this kind of narrative of civilizational progress or civilized progress towards uh, a better form of life. And the other thing that might be worth considering here is that civil society then is connected to also the concept of civil rights. Um, that'll be important for this discussion about um, kind of social movements and the strategy of social movements, particularly in, in um, the arena of criminal justice and criminal justice reform. But just if you think about civil society and this concept of a, um, you know, membership in a civic community, okay, civil rights are those rights of citizens Okay, or the rights that you possess by virtue of being a citizen of a particular community. So it's that same idea of it draws on the root concept of a city or a community. And, you know, in this sense, we're talking now about a nation state in the, in the United States that as a citizen of the United States, you enjoy certain civil rights. Um, and the Bill of Rights, right, the, amend the first 10 amend amendments to the Constitution provide important rights for the citizens of the United States, uh, freedom of speech, freedom of association, expression. Um, in the liberal tradition, civil rights are typically negative rights. That is, they are rights against interference by the government on individual liberty. 
um, you know, that your activities as an individual, if they're perceived as being constrained um, by the operations of the government, then civil rights place limitations on what the government is permitted to do when intruding on an individual's choices or an individual's life. And in the context of uh, criminal justice reform, there are many affirmative cases that are connected to civil rights. And you know, you might think of that in terms of protection from certain types of search and seizure, right? Cruel and unusual punishment, the right to privacy. These are all examples of civil rights that are referenced in cases that we have that are being written at uh, the DDI. And the demand for civil rights enforcement or civil rights expansion, okay, forms a, a key element of a variety of different social movements and, and their public demands in civil society. So you might think of, for example, the uh, movements to abolish the death penalty, civil society actors, organizations that organize around the abolition of the death penalty, what they're demanding there is an expansion of the civil right to um, you know, avoid cruel and unusual punishment um, or to, that the government cannot impose cr cruel and unusual punishment via the Eighth Amendment. Um, some abolitionists might also make arguments about the civil rights to equal protection under the law, the 14th Amendment, that is that the death penalty is applied in a manner that is racist and um, therefore that the death penalty cannot be imposed by the state because it violates equal protection under the law. There are a variety of different civil rights claims that could be made in the context of criminal justice reform. Um, you know, rights talk is a common element of U.S. political strategy because of the legal and political importance that rights have in our in our tradition, um, in our politics. Um, if you think about kind of mainstream education that people receive on the civil rights movement in the 1960s and beyond, it also forms part of what you might refer to as a, a civic religion or a civil code. This idea of you know the expansion of civil rights as um, aiming towards what, you know, what Lincoln called a, a more perfect union, this idea of perfectibility or in the liberal tradition, the move towards civilization that is that you know, gradually we will reach a, a form of accord or sympathy or harmony that means that we've reached the proper balance of, of rights that permit people to pursue a version of the good life that um, you know, the government does not interfere with. Um, there are also many criticisms of rights that are found um, in the various positions that you'll be reading about this year um, in criminal justice reform. So for example, the critical legal studies movement, um, critical race theory in, in the kind of legal literature, um, some abolitionists are fairly um, skeptical of, of rights talk. And the a common basis for most of those criticisms is that rights, and because rights are, they are legal claims, so they require legal enforcement. You know, you have, if you believe that your rights have been violated, you're ultimately going to end up a lot of times in court to attempt to make the rights claim um, enforceable. Um, that enforcement never occurs on a neutral field or that the law isn't a neutral tool. So that access to legal representation, access to the highest quality of legal argument is um, you know, grounded in access to resources so that um, marginalized groups in our society are, are kind of playing, um, they're playing on an uneven field when making rights claims. Um, so there are, there are a number of criticisms of rights as a political strategy that come out of some, um, you know, critiques that you'll see that aren't um, connected to Afro-pessimism, but we'll kind of get to the relationship between those here in a second. Um, there, are, there are some of those um, criticisms that I might also permit kind of the strategic use of rights claims. So um, in some of the discussion that we had in one of the topic lectures about abolition, you know, you might think of this as there are some ways in which people could make rights-based arguments and still be somewhat critical of the idea that rights are sufficient in and of themselves to provide some version of the good life. So, you know, arguments about non-reformist reforms that kind of take the idea that some rights claims might serve as a lever or a wedge that can um, provide a, a much larger structural transformation, um, the enforcement of some rights as positive rights. So, for example, the 13th Amendment AF being uh, written by our lab is, you know, some versions of 13th Amendment interpretation that take, for instance, the badges and incidents of slavery that the government has an obligation to get uh, to address the badges and incidents of slavery. You could see that being read in a negative way. That is that the government, all that the government has to do is to ensure that there, uh, that no one legally holds slaves. There's also a positive interpretation of that, um, the rights secured by that amendment to say that the government has a positive obligation to remove the badges and incidents of slavery, to redress them, um, you know, that it isn't simply a, a, a negative right, but is a positive one, that 
individuals could enforce rights claims to something, not just freedom from the government, but an obligation on the government to do something to redress um, redress the harms that they've suffered. And, you know, examples of that in the kind of radical moments of reconstruction that some people argue that those reconstruction amendments were initially understood in much, in much more positive terms than, than purely negative ones, that they're, you know, the, the concept of 40 acres and a mule, that there would be land redistribution during reconstruction, that part of removing the badges and incidents of slavery would be to reform um, at a very deep level, the kind of economic and political structures of the United States. Um, there's also the concept of rearticulating rights or kind of rights claims that change both who receives rights and, and the nature of rights themselves. So, you know, the recent Title VII case decided by the Supreme Court to expand Title VII protections against discrimination based on sex to um, incidents of discrimination, employment discrimination against um, GLBTQ um, people that that's an example of rearticulating a right against discrimination based on sex to include, um, you know, a concept that at, at least many of the people, um, you know, passing the Civil Rights Act and, and um, understanding Title VII would would likely not have anticipated that um, discrimination based on sex would be expanded to include some of these other categories. Um, now, you know, to kind of get back to the pessimist articulation of some of these arguments, the pessimist position is critical of even those groups or schools of thought that have a kind of critically informed or skeptical approach to rights talk. And to think about this, just the, you know, another paragraph, the second paragraph of the essay on, on page 18. So this is Wilderson again, uh, quote, in light of this, coalitions and social movements, even radical social movements like the prison abolition movement, bound up in the solicitation of hegemony, so as to fortify and extend the interlocutory, that is between speakers, life of civil society, ultimately accommodate only the satiable demands and finite antagonisms of civil society's junior partners, i.e. immigrants, white women, and the working class, but foreclose upon the insatiable demands and endless antagonisms of the prison slave and the prison slave in waiting. In short, Whereas such coalitions and social movements cannot be called the outright handmaidens of white supremacy, their rhetorical structures and political desire are unwritten, underwritten by a supplemental anti-blackness. So let's unpack this in terms of the ways that we've defined civil society and, and civil rights thus far in, in this example of prison abolition. So I mentioned earlier the idea that there are many abolitionists who might be critical of the kind of rights-based advocacy to begin with. There are some abolitionists who believe in the strategic use of, of constitutional rights. So for instance, if you were to read, um, there's a, a very long uh, law recent law review in the Harvard Law Review, uh, an article on abolition constitutionalism that is what would constitutional look like uh, constitutional rights claims look like when read from an abolitionist perspective and you know to some extent the movement examples that i was discussing above about way, the ways in which civil rights claims could be about expanding those claims a kind of non-reformist reform perspective on what it might mean to make a rights claim or to rearticulate the notion of of what a right is and who it who it applies to and where it applies you know, what Wilderson is referring to here as junior partners, immigrants, white women, and the working class, you know, that Title VII example that I gave above, you might see that as falling in that example of junior partner. That is a, a, an actor in civil society who, you know, at different points or maybe currently occupies a, a lower level in the hierarchy of civil life um, or um, is excluded from some aspects of civil life. So, for example, you know, the expansion of sex discrimination, uh, protection against sex discrimination to employment reflects a demand on the part of many women's groups um, to be included in an important element of civic and civil life, that is public participation in employment and the distribution of resources, kind of the, the movement of um, in in first and second wave feminism of women from a private domestic sphere okay, into civic and public life, the right to vote for women, um, the right to participate in employment and not be discriminated against, discriminated against on the basis of sex. You know, Wilderson is referring to um, junior partnership here in that sense of actors in civil society not accorded the full status of citizen or kind of the full rights and obligations of citizens 
making claims that they ought to enjoy um, those full rights. Um, Willerson here is referring to those as satiable demands, that is a demand that can be met. So, you know, the demand of non-discrimination in employment, um, according to Wilderson, that can be met, but there are other demets that, uh, demands that are insatiable, okay, or antagonisms that are endless, that is that there are demands that could not be met. And those demands, uh, according to Wilderson, are gonna emerge from the position of, or be reflected in the position of the prison slave and the prison slave in waiting. And in order to define that, we're gonna have to get into some, some other terms, but, I hope that people understand that part of what Wilderson is setting up here is the idea that even those radical social movements that are interested in, you know, a non-reformist reform or an expansive right, rights claim, as long as they're speaking the language of and being represented in civil discourse, in civil speech, civil society, um, those are ultimately demands that are satiable because they can be heard in the existing terms of that society. So, you know, if you were to think about, for example, expanding the right to vote or expanding the right to um, non-discrimination, those are, are claims based on an existing understanding that then it's like we need to re-articulate or, or change the way in which that understanding is applied, but we don't necessarily need to change the basic terms of the debate itself, right? Um, that there's disagreement over the, the nature uh, of the application or implementation of those rights, but not over rights themselves or citizenship itself, for example, right? Um, and I, I, the next kind of term that I'm gonna define here that comes out of that paragraph that we just read is the, the notion of hegemony or the concept of hegemony, okay? So in that paragraph that I was just reading, um, the, the second one in the essay, um, you know, you'll you would notice that the that notion of the interlocutory life of civil society civil discourse right civil debate um that movements even radical movements who are participating in civil society are quote bound up in the solicitation of hegemony so what does that mean solicit right to to ask for you know to ask for attention to ask for address um to speak to um and hegemony so what does hegemony mean here and Hegemony is a, a concept, especially as it's used in this essay, that comes out of um, the Marxist tradition. Okay, so in the Marxist tradition, you have this issue where um, Marx himself and a bunch of early Marxists argued that capitalism was um, intrinsically exploitative. That is, it was always taking value away from laborers and giving it to capital. <laughs> capital existed in a fundamentally exploitative relationship with labor, right? That the, the interests of the, the working class and the capitalists cannot be reconciled. Um, it is only via exploitation that um, capitalism, that capital as a social relationship could even exist. And given this argument, you know, the survival of capitalism throughout the, the late 19th and early 20th century um, posed a, a problem for some of these uh, early understandings of uh, Marxism. That is that, well, if capitalism is intrinsically exploitative and, and exploitation grows as capitalism grows, what explains the survival of capitalism? Because in theory, capitalism might generate, um, to use a, a phrase that shows up here sometimes, might generate its own grave diggers. That is that because capitalism could be a system that would be so exploitative, that, uh, that workers and um, the kind of exploited members of a capitalist society would rise up um, just given that their interests could not be accommodated within capitalism, they would see the need for revolutionary change and that would bring about the end of capitalism. Capitalism survived through a number of different economic crises, um, a, different, uh, a number of different kind of political movements and demands. And so what, what explains this? The Marxists needed a concept to explain this. And hegemony is one of the major concepts introduced to try and explain this set of results. So hegemony refers to a form of power relationship that is exercised with some degree of consent, okay? So hegemony in this way is actually opposed to a word that sometimes I think people use um, kind of as though it were synonymous with hegemony. Hegemony is not the same as domination, okay? If domination is just the, to, you know, that where one element of a system dominates another, right? Right. The, the like the boot on the face or the the truncheon, the police truncheon applied to the to the protester. That 
hegemony instead refers to a set of relationships in which there is some degree of consent. And it might not be consent that's kind of well informed or, or consent that um, is well understood, but nevertheless, that there is a degree of consent on the part of the people who are subject to that power relationship. And this use of hegemony in Marxist theory kind of first comes in the works of Antonio Gramsci, who's a, an Italian, Italian Marxist. And Gramsci was writing in particular about, um, in his prison notebooks, he was, he was arrested and, and you know, lived um, out a, a large portion of his life in Italy in, in prison. He's writing in prison about, so, you know, kind of both elements of strategy. So how do we organize a set of movements for a, a socialist or communist revolution? And also trying to theoretically explain, like, why have we had so much trouble doing that thus far? Um, why haven't we been able to kind of get people to see that capitalism is exploitive enough that they should overthrow it in a revolution? And uh, that accounts for, you know, the sort of second essay that we're going to reference here um, briefly, uh, another card that I'll read you, um, Gramsci's Black Marx, Wither the Slave in Civil Society. You know, Wilderson is writing critically about the Gramscian and the Marxist tradition. So he's writing, you know, as a way of opposing Gramsci's arguments about hegemony. So let's talk for a moment about what it might mean to think about power hegemonically. That is that, you know, you're going to see relationships in civil society that are hegemonic. They will display features of common sense, just like this notion that everybody kind of accepts um, some elements of hegemonic systems as that they're taken for granted, they're taken as given. Um, so to discuss one of those earlier examples, um, you know, the struggle for women's suffrage and, and for employment on, on the part of women, um, you know, for large portions uh, of American history and, and European history, the exclusion of women from voting and the exclusion of women um, from uh, wage employment was taken as a given, taken as common sense that, you know, the the notion of a the a woman's role in uh, civic and family life as being a domestic role that's that's an example of a, a hegemonic um, set of relationships that is exercised with some degree of consent that you would have a large number of women who might understand themselves in terms of um, you know playing a domestic role um, that. That doesn't mean, and, and a hegemonic relationship is one that's never exercised with complete and total success. So, you know, it, this is not to suggest that because the, the idea of the, you know, woman in a nuclear family as playing a domestic role versus the male breadwinner, to refer to that as hegemonic does not mean that there aren't people at all times in American society who disagreed with that vision or who didn't live their lives in that way. It's that that would operate outside the boundaries of common sense or outside the boundaries of a norm, okay? And that's, that's what we mean here by hegemony, okay? That is, these relationships in civil society that are, are taken as given, they're taken as common sense. And the movements and social movements that might see using civil rights strategically in political struggle, that they would be operating in a way then that solicits hegemony. They're speaking the language of the kind of dominant political actors or the existing constituted forms of authority when they use the language of rights. So, for instance, to claim that Title VII uh, bars discrimination based on sex, and that also means that you, you know, can't be fired for um, being gay, that's an argument that speaks some of the dominant relationship or what's given about public life, even as it articulates a resistant version of that. So, you know, it relies on this notion that there are certain individual rights. So, uh, and citizenship determines the boundaries of those rights. Implicitly, even the resistant claim accepts some elements of the hegemonic understanding of those rights um, as common sense, as, as a norm. So Wilderson's criticism of some of the Gramscian position, um, which we'll get in, I'm, I'm going to read a portion of Gramsci's Black Marx where he summarizes the Gramscian position about social movements and resistant movements, and then contrasts that eventually to his own position. So this is on pages um, 226 and 227 of Gramsci's Black Marx, and I'm just going to read the, the whole longer passage here. Um, 
students of struggle return to right students of social movements students of social struggle return doggedly to the prison notebooks that's one of gramsci's books for insights regarding how to bring about a revolution in in a society in which state slash capital formations are in some way protected by the trenches of civil society it is this outer perimeter this discursive trench constructed by an ensemble of private initiatives, activities, and an ensemble of postable questions, hegemony, which must be reconfigured before a revolution can take the form of a frontal assault. So he's here summarizing Gram Gramsci's position. That is that you would have actors in civil, resistant actors in civil society since they can't take on the state or capital head on. Instead, they have to kind of fight it in, in the trenches of civil society. They have to change what set of questions are posable. That is, how can we pose the questions of what it is that we want? How can we pose the demands of our social movement? And this idea that you would gradually reconfigure what is acceptable civil discourse or acceptable civil argument prior to a revolutionary frontal assault against the state or against capital, okay? And to, Wilderson continues, but this trench called civil society is not for Gramsci in and of itself the bane of the working class. That is, to be in civil society isn't intrinsically opposed to being a member of the working class. Quote, instead it op represents a terrain to be occupied, assumed and appropriated in a pedagogic project of transforming common sense into good sense. This notion of destruction construction is a war of position which involves agitating within civil society in a revolutionary moment that builds qualitatively new social relationships. A war of position is a struggle that engages on a wide range of fronts in which the state is normally defined as only one aspect. For Gramsci, a war of position is the most decisive form of engagement because it is the form in which bourgeois power is exercised and victory on these fronts makes possible or a conclusive, front, a conclusive frontal attack or a war of movement. So to unpack that a little bit, that you would transform the common sense that is the hegemonic sense of civil society into good sense. You would, through the operation of civil discourse and argument, um, the expression of solidarity, political organizing, you know, social movements would re-articulate what is common sense into good sense. That is kind of theoretically informed activity on the part of resistant groups to transform civil society, to prepare larger numbers of people to organize together to confront directly the interests of state or capital. So that first stage is referred to as a war of position. Okay, a war of position is that first stage of struggle in civil society to set up eventually a war of movement that is taking down um, the kind of the version of state and capital that we that we find um, before us. Okay, to quote Wilderson further, this same you know can just continuing the same passage. In other words, for revolution to be feasible, the proletariat must be hailed in the Althusserian sense of a word of the word to a revolutionary position. I'm not going to go into Althusser, who's a different Marxist theorist here in this notion of the hail. Um, that's that would be a whole other <laughs> lecture or elective. Um, you can it, it, that might be a useful set of terms to to Google or to to look up to help you read through this passage. But for the moment, we're going to stick with Gramsci. Okay, and this is the idea that in civil society, for a revolution to be feasible, the proletariat. Okay, you've got to address them as a, a you know a set of potential revolutionaries. For Gramsci, it is within this trench between the economic structure and the state with its legislation and its coercion within civil society that this hailing must take place. And for that, uh, for that to happen, the trench, civil society must be transformed. A war of position can be summed up as a process by which assimilating certain traditional intellectuals and throughout the whole process, all the struggles personnel, if you will, fashion a discourse on all of civil society's fronts through which they will eventually become hegemonic. In this way, the common sense, the spontaneous consent of the ruled toward the ideology of the rulers finds its good sense. Fragments of antagonistic sentiment transformed into an ensemble of questions which prior to this process could not be posed i.e. what is to be done. Common sense, by contrast, is a way of affecting the prevailing formamentus. Okay, so we're gonna pause here. The terms that we've already defined, this idea of common sense as kind of the hegemonic norm, okay? That's also what's being referred to here as the ideology of the rulers, okay? And notice he uses this idea of spontaneous consent. That is that to some extent, the degree to which, you know, 
for instance, in the United States, when we go to public schools, when we learn about our constitutional traditions, our civic traditions, our civil religion um, is a, a phrase that you might be familiar with, that in a way, you know, you're learning common sense in a number of different locations uh, throughout your life in a way that is spontaneous in the sense that it may not even be that conscious to you that it is forming part of who you are and what you believe and how you understand the world. So that's in part how this comes to be taken for granted or taken as given, okay? And he's referencing again this notion of a war of, a war of position. Okay, that is that, you know, in the trenches of civil society and civil debate, you would gradually transform the understanding of the members of that civil society so that they would eventually be willing to become revolutionaries. Um, there's this notion here of traditional intellectuals and organic intellectuals. So Gramsci is referring there, traditional intellectuals would occupy a position in the uh, uh, kind of hierarchy of civil society that um, is, you know, a position that's a a relatively privileged position. So you might think of, you know, university professors or legal scholars here to formulate traditional intellectuals. And organic intellectuals would be those who are, you know, they come from a, a background and, and a set of experiences, a social position that is, it's, they are organically experiencing those things that the theory of Marxism is trying to explain. So that this is a set of intellectuals who have themselves been exploited or have suffered the consequences of living in the lower rungs of a capitalist society. And that through civil discourse in this war of position, <coughs> that you would link the understanding of some traditional intellectuals and organic intellectuals and begin to articulate the set of claims and the arguments that they have against the system together, okay? That that's part of that war of position. And notice that Willerson observes here that a Gramscian war of position is designed around this idea of counter hegemony, that eventually you would link enough of the actors in civil society and various civil movements and civil rights organizations or social movements to make a set of demands that they then see as connected to form a counter hegemonic block that is a new norm, a new common sense, a new way of articulating who it is that we as members of these social movements um, could be or, or what we could do, that notion of the question, what is to be done, that we could pose different questions that were previously outside the scope of our political system or our, our civil discourse, okay, introducing new demands, new things that can be understood in new ways. So, you know, to draw from some examples of, of contemporary social movements, right, you might think of the, the concept of a Green New Deal, right, that, or the Sunshine Movement, um, you know, that you're articulating this set of concerns that are not posable in the existing economic order, that is, that there are a set of ecological constraints that ought to bind economic activity so that our entire economy needs to be reorganized. Notice that does speak some of the dominant language, right? The New Deal is a part of left-wing political tradition um, in the United States that when you're talking about a Green New Deal, it's re-articulating part of that left-wing history to account for new circumstances. So the new common sense would be, you know, not just that we need some universal program like Social Security, but that we would expand some of the governmental programs or governmental obligations to take on ecological challenges that previously couldn't be posed in the terms that um, our society had. So that didn't see those as kind of public problems that deserve full-scale reorganization like the New Deal did. Right, and that's this idea of a war of position where there are contingent, you know, exclusions or contingent examples of questions that can't be posed. That if you can change civil society, you could change the set of questions um, that could be posed or the set of demands that could be made. Um, and so that means that civil society isn't intrinsically opposed to the interests of the worker. Right, it is not the bane of the worker. It is instead contingently. Um, supporting a set of exploitative relationships and it could be changed or reformed um, to change that set of relationships. And that's where you get some of this notion of criminal justice reform, right? That if there are sufficient claims made in civil society to re-articulate what it means to have criminal justice, that you could see a very wide range or wide scope of potential reforms. Um, that also relies on that idea of contingent exclusion that could be changed or reformed. And the last little bit here, this relationship of agonism versus antagonism, okay? 
agonism refers to the, the agon in, in Greek, in kind of classic political theory that is drawn on in, in the European political tradition and the American political tradition. The notion of the agon is this space in public life where you wrestle or argue. It originally comes from a sports competition of wrestling, but the analogy being made to political life here is that you wrestle and argue um, with one another. You try and come up with um, you know, within the kind of rule ba rules based competition form, the rules here being, for instance, the constitutional rules about um, rights and obligations that we have in our society, that within that set of rules that you can work out um, a set of answers to, to various questions or problems that are being posed in civil society or in civil discourse, as opposed to antagonism, which is a relationship where those interests can't be reconciled. So in the agon where, you know, it's like, well, we're competitors, but we're going to reach an endpoint or we're going to reach a, a point of agreement. An antagonistic relationship is a, a friend enemy relationship in which there can't be compromise. Okay. And so the war of position uses the tools of agonism to arrive at this moment of antagonistic or revolutionary um, political struggle, okay? Um, Wilderson is criticizing the Gramscian tradition because he's gonna try and say that there is a position from which you cannot make um, any solicitation on hegemony or a position that cannot be, it is inherently antagonistic towards civil society. So if civil society is a place where workers demands uh, contrary to exploitation or the demands of women's movements for suffrage or the demands of immigrant movements for citizenship could be met, those satiable demands, that there's gonna be a position, a category of demand that is insatiable, it is endless, it is an antagonism um, that is inherent to civil society, it cannot be reconciled, okay? And that gets back to that notion of constitutive exclusion of blackness. To be constitutively exclusion, to be constitutively excluded means that the relationship between blackness and civil society is intrinsically antagonistic. It cannot be changed from an antagonistic relationship into an agonist, uh, agonist one, and it cannot be posed in terms of um, existing common sense or transformed, uh, that like the common sense cannot be transformed. So as a way to reconcile civil society and the position of blackness. Um, I'm going to wrap up this portion of the video here and, and we'll get into the next set of terms to define in just a moment.